welcome back everybody to When the Dutch Went to Space, an RP1 playthrough using realism overall and real solar system. And I'm realizing that I should update my trailer video because I'm way cooler footage now. Uh, anyway, today's episode kicks off in the 11th of March 1959, in which we are launching Iris 01. On top of a, uh, an NL1, it's actually the fourth flight of this uh, rocket. Um, it's also going to be the last flight of this rocket because we've unlocked better tech in the last episode and you can actually see what the Stentor boosters is failing on this flight. But we've more than enough thrust left to bring this thing to orbit. So um, Iris number one is a, is a super interesting flight. It's bringing a new experiment to space. It's bringing image spectrometry. Um, interesting experiment. Basically, it's it's light which you ref which reflects from the Earth and then is split. The beam is split into a spectrum, much like imagine the album cover of um, Pink Floyd, where you have this prism where the light breaks into all these different colors. So basically, you record multiple images. I think hundreds of different images based on the different wavelength of the light that passes from the prism. And the advantage is that you now can search for certain contexts like vegetation or, or minerals or stuff like that for potential mining sites. Also assessment of polluters, waters, oceans uh, is done in that way. Two weeks later on the 23rd of March we are launching Iris 02. And if you notice we are using a smaller pad. We are using the under 60 ton pads. Uh, the satellite is... Uh, I think it's somewhere between 100 and 300 kilo, kilos. So this launcher can lift 300 kilogram to orbit, which is a little bit more than the NL1, but it's it's way lighter, it's way smaller, it uses a new satellite bus, and most of all, it's using a new engine. So it's using the Delta Free engine on the lower stage. Uh, it's using the same gamma upper stages, but the Delta engine is a, a project from uh, BAE in the 1950s. And if you want to know more about it, I would recommend you look up Say Monsters, which runs a YouTube channel. I'll, I'll link them in the uh, description. Uh, it's called A Very British Space Program, which is awesome. And I all encourage you to go watch that. Um, RS number two is looking for Cherenkov radiation. These are high energy particles and they are charged particles they travel actually faster than light in a particular medium and uh, Cherenkov got his Nobel Prize last year in 1959 so well, in our universe and so uh, we decided to put his theory to the test and put a satellite out there to measure it and the international collaboration actually reaches uh, its, its summit in the International Research Alliance for Space Exploration or otherwise called IRIS and you'll see a bit more of that in uh, the next episode. But yeah, um, the idea is that these countries work together on new satellites and new satellite technology and then bring that into space. In, the, in parallel, the Dutch are also going to run their own science experiments. But I want to introduce a bit more international cooperation at this point because it's going to be important for us in the future. Um, we've got quite a few Iris satellites lighted up and um, bring them to, uh, to orbit. Here we can see the second stage, still using the gamma engines provided to us by the, the British. And uh, St. Myers actually modeled them based on some very obscure documents that are almost impossible to find on the internet. But yeah, the second stage still burns for about two minutes in the first, uh, or the second stage, and then the third stage also burns for about two minutes, bringing the satellites to orbit. You'll notice we also redesigned the satellite bus. So we came up with a new design for the satellite, which is lighter, cheaper. It has uh, still space for enough experiments, but it can run for, I don't know, something like a week, which is more than enough to capture these particular experiments. And once we are going into deep space, we will need better solar panels and better batteries to uh, to stay alive but for now this is more than enough and uh, it's a cheap launcher so let's keep using that we are coming up on the 12th of april 1959 project wolf and wolf is an interesting name so i based this on the book of course of puck in the petaflet and in the book we have the the hane and Wolf. 
And um, so it's a werewolf who has a ferry and nobody wants to be on his ferry. But the objective of the ferry is actually to travel someplace and get back. So werewolf, where and, and coming back again. And, and in, in Dutch it's a really nice play of words. So I guess we'll just have to live with it. We see uh, the new same launcher. They're all, I didn't mention it, they're also super cheap to produce. So I was very happy with this design. It's using the smaller pad, it's cheaper engines and they can produce faster. The ascent profile is a little bit different and we don't need additional stentor boosters that failed us on the previous descent. Uh, but something else is going to fail us on this ascent. But we'll recover. You'll see that when we hit the third stage. So the payload of this mission is of course, uh, well not a wolf, I guess a lot of people in the Netherlands would love to launch their wolves up into space by now because they're becoming a bit of a problem. And then again, isn't the fault of the animal itself, we never know. So um, I guess we'll just go with our space hamster again. And uh, he's up for another flight going up there and this time coming back in one piece as he did in the previous one. But the previous ones were suborbital hops. Now he's actually going in orbit. And this is reminiscent of Ham the chimpanzee. And NASA launched Ham I think in 1960. I would have to look that up. Uh, but he flew on a Mercury craft, yes, so somewhere in the 60s. And Ham is an interesting monkey because they trained him to perform a certain task. So they trained him to pull a lever. And quite brutally, actually. They, they would give him shocks on the soles of his feet as a, uh, when he would not perform his task and then a reward when he would perform his task. And over the course of something like 15 months, they trained him to perform his task flawlessly. Once he was up in space, he would also perform this task, only with slight delay compared to uh, terrestrial activities. Well, here we see the misfire. So one of our Alex uh, rockets failed to ignite. Fortunately, love the, the, the second one did ignite. And the alloging is basically the settling of the fluid or of the, of the fuel to the lower part of the tank. So you can imagine when there is no uh, gravity, the fuel will just float up there in bubbles and uh, not go into the engine voluntarily. And since there's no engine, then there's no pressure, etc. etc. So we need a, a, a quick bump to get started. Anyway, we can see our uh, space hamster getting back after a successful, uh, I think he spent a day in space. And uh, I hope he has a, a comfortable ride back. Uh, Ham for sure didn't. He pulled 17 G's due to a malfunctioning escape system, <laughs> which is incredible. Um, and I think I read somewhere he spent days walking around at the NASA headquarters greeting guests, but I could not really find that reference again. So maybe I just made that up at some point. I did find out he, at some point he transferred him to a zoo, uh, living out his rest of his days in boredom, I guess. Uh, the 19th of May 1959. This is the day somebody finally gets to space. So Mike is flying the uh, the Fokker X3D. It's the rocket version of the plane. And, uh, she just lost her canards by pulling too heavy on the stick. Uh, this thing pulls a lot of G, so uh, there's two of the Stentor rooster, uh, rocket boosters strapped to the top and the, and the side balancing out the weight. And um, she managed to get a 45 degree angle, which is more than enough to bring the plane to space. So the boosters run for, I think it's about a minute, and then get ejected from uh, the frame. And the plane just continuously pushes itself up. It's, it's using also the XLR11 rocket motor with a little bit extra fuel in the, in the wings. We need a bit more fuel to get it done. And I think I can get this plane all the way up to 140, but I'm not going to challenge it. This is a super risky design. See, she depleted the boosters and you can see the fairing of the XLR11 is heating up. Uh, but it won't explode. And we can see now, um, I'm putting up the, uh, the data a little bit for you. You can see that it will glide all the way up to 100 kilometers. And I've shut down the engine. There actually is quite a bit of fuel left. So uh, we could probably do a bit more. But I'm always a bit scared when trying this with planes. So this plane is basically exactly the same as the previous planes. But we swapped out the cockpit. Um, swapping out the, uh, the X1 cockpit for the one that was used in the X15. And um, 
and you can see the cockpit in all its glory and you can see Micah sitting enjoying the immense sight being the first person to reach the limits of space well space as defined by the Americans I guess so this is a hundred kilometers up I think the Carmen line officially goes 140 but hey, if it's science and it gets us the mission I'm more than happy with the but we can see that she's now using the RCS to compensate and the plane is really heating up. I'm almost losing my RCS thrusters. Um, but the plane stays in one piece and we're already subsonic. And she's gliding. I did miscalculate the distance to um, the spaceport because she'll actually end up somewhere over the North Sea. Uh, that was not supposed to happen. You're gonna do so unfortunately enough she she's trained for this we've tried this we've tested this she'll uh, she'll actually try to glide all the way to the uk but uh, won't make it so uh, i guess we'll have to fish her out of the north sea no problem with that you can see the coastline of the netherlands in the background but you can already see the uk a little bit closer so we're somewhere in the middle um, if you ever have the opportunity go sail that stretch because it's awesome it's about 100 nautical miles and spending the night on the on the open channel is an amazing event anyway uh, Mike has deployed a parachute is on her way down Joe Walker actually manages this in 1963 on the x-15 so we're we're four years earlier than the, U, uh, the US so we're making great pace however and by contrast the Soviets have already smacked the moon with a probe they have photographed it and, and we've not even left low Earth orbit um, but you'll see that in the next episode we'll get closer and we actually come close to the delta v of being able to hit the moon we just don't have the tech to make it that precise to actually um, end up in the proper spot in space on the right time but hey, well we'll see that in the next episode um, we can see her coming down she's relying heavily on the parachute and i guess you will have a great welcome when coming back with a ticket tape parade and stuff like that um, well that's the flight of the fokker xr 3d i hope to see you in the next episode which we're launching a navigation satellite network